This is another installment in the DYI SDR video series. In the last video, we looked at the black pill demodulating IQ baseband signals from a Talo mixer. With that set up, the black pill was able to recover CW or Morse code signals by treating the IQ data stream as upper sideband audio. This worked well enough. But what was missing was a way to set the local oscillator frequency applied to the mixer. This iteration of the project addresses that and goes a bit further to include code that allows the black pill to also do the control logic including key input for a four band CW transceiver. As we did last time, we'll start by looking at the touchscreen display and then for those interested, we'll look behind the display to get a clearer understanding of what this version of the setup brings to the table. When we last saw this project, the display looked like this. And today, it looks like this. As you can see, 95% of the change is in the addition of a new row of buttons. Since the first video detailed the original buttons, I'll for the most part skip them and let those interested go back to that video to see or review their functionality. So just looking at the new row, we see it's broken into two groups, a set of five and a set of three. I think of the set of five as band buttons, but more accurately as configured, we have four band buttons and a preset for WWV at 10 MHz. These buttons, technically, can be configured in any order or way that you want. As I have it, the 80 meter band is on the left and it goes up in frequency ending at 20 meters on the fourth button. And, as it noted, the fifth button tunes to WWV. Now, to explain the project's limitation and the rationale behind it, let me say this. Screen space is the number one limitation. And on the rationale side of the equation, keep it simple is the number one rule. So what happens when a band button is pressed is the SI5351 shifts the mixer frequency to a predetermined value. Other than the frequency limitations of the 5351, and the filter set at the antenna, the radio doesn't care what frequencies apply to it. Like many CW ops, each band has a favorite area that I like to operate in. So when a band button is pressed, a mixer frequency has been chosen, programmed, to put the radio in the middle of that space. Then using the on-screen tuning buttons, I can tune up to 25 kilohertz either side of that frequency. For 30 meters, that's essentially the entire CW portion of the band. But to be clear, there's no shifting of the LO frequency once the band button has been pressed. So there is that limitation. But for my op habits, it's not a showstop. Being able to see a 25 kilohertz window of what's around me is way more desirable than the ability to tune the entire band but hearing only 500 hertz of it at any given moment. Alternatively, if your goal was to build a monobander, you could allocate all five band buttons to tuning across just that one band, and conversely have access to a larger portion of your chosen band. For example, 5 times 50 kilohertz will give you access to approximately 250 kilohertz of spectrum. At compile time, you're free to pick and choose how to designate what they do. The fifth band button, the WWV button, is there mostly as a confidence check in the accuracy of the SI5351. At this time, there's no provision to apply on-the-fly crystal corrections. My experience has been once the correction value has been established, there's little observable drift in frequency over the course of a QSO. But day-to-day -day frequency checks reveal a 10 to 20 hertz drift is pretty typical. Again, unnoticed in a given QSO, but for whisper spotting, it could be something to think about. 
Now, moving on to the right of the band buttons, we find a group of three buttons labeled FW, FM, and FN. These are filter selection buttons, wide, medium, and narrow. The wide is approximately 2.5 kilohertz, medium is approximately 1,000, and narrow is close to 500 hertz. As described in the first video, the 49 kilohertz sample frequency is decimated down to 6 kilohertz, so audio quality, in my opinion, is really only suitable for CW work. You can understand what's being said on WWV, but no audiophile would ever listen to their favorite music station with this setup. The last display feature to note is in the first video there was an S reading that was nothing more than the gain being applied to maintain constant audio. That has been replaced with an S meter reading. More testing needs to be done to better calibrate it, but it does change one S unit for every 6 dB of gain change. So to interpret what you're seeing, this reading is the S value plus the number of dB over that S value. As long as the S value is less than 9, the dB over value will never exceed 5.9. When it goes to 6 dB, the combined reading will roll up to the next S unit and start over again. So that's pretty much it for the display user interface side of the project. Understand there's no RIT, no split frequency, no noise blanker or other amenities that we're often used to having. However, in my opinion, this piece of kit has a lot to offer those who want an SDR view of the space they're operating in. Now, let's go behind the curtain and look at the hardware side of this project. Like in the first video, we still have the STM32F411 black pill doing the processing, a 2.4 inch TFT display, and an ITS 24-bit soundboard doing the IQ in and audio out part. The new add is there are now six I.O. lines and to support them a four channel level shifter and a 4N32 optical coupler has been added too. The optical coupler handles the inbound key interface while two channels of the level shifter handle the black pill to SI5351 communications. A third level shifter channel is used on the outbound push to talk control. And finally, two black pill IO lines go direct to the outboard four band filter switching hardware. In my setup, I found that while there's an apparent level mismatch between the black pill's 3.3 volt logic and the 5 volt sourced band filter controls, both sides of this part of the interface work happily together without the need for level translation. If your goal is build just a receiver, the SI5351 work fine directly connected to the black pill in receive mode, but when it came to operating as a transmitter, logic level shifting was needed to maintain reliable messaging between the two devices. To be honest, that took me a while to sort out. Other things done to mitigate RF-induced lockup included bridging ground and VCC runs with surface mount type 0.1 microfarad capacitors at the black pill's header pins and the addition of a copper clad PC board to act as a ground plane. This was sandwiched between the back of the TFT display and the black pill slash soundboard pair. Whether these ads are actually needed at this point, it's hard to say. I have two other black pills with similar TFT displays running in essentially the same environment, neither of which needs this extra level of isolation. However, given the nature of home brewing, I suspect what is needed is going to vary from installation to installation, and some experimentation will likely be needed before your project is complete. Another build point I'd like to make is I like to use these DuPont jumpers for these projects. It makes the build easy to get going, but honestly, 
They're not the best and can fail over time. I can improve their durability by super gluing groups of them together and hot gluing the transition from wire to plastic shields. But if your goal is building something for backpacking, then it would probably be worth your while to work up a motherboard to host these interconnections. You could still use header sockets allowing swap outs between daughter boards. For example, I found one of the lines in the four channel level shifter was defective, leaving me with just three usable lines. It would have been a painful process to fix had it been soldered in place. Well, that's pretty much it for the hardware side. So let's close out by watching this setup in trans mode doing a test call to the RBN network and see who reads its signal. So the test call was sent on 30 meters using about 40 watts into an inverted V and a dozen stations reported back, five of which heard the signal in excess of 20 dB. Pretty cool for what was in play here, don't you think? Well that's it for now and good luck with your next project.